Hi everyone, Pam Marshone here to share with you today active stretch restorative movement. So active stretch restorative movement, what is that? Well, that is where we actively stretch to then restore functional movement into the body. We use gravity, ground reaction force, our own body weight, mass and momentum to create and facilitate more functional movement in the body. So let's get started. We're gonna start with our toes pointing straight ahead and I, I'm demonstrating this with my shoes off because I just feel a little more rooted to the ground. So I'm gonna actually spread my toes out a little bit just so I can see daylight between each toe and I'm gonna just feel like I have a really good, solid, comfortable stance. And from here, I'm gonna to start to arm swing around and around. Now the arm swing is more than just an arm swing. The arm swing creates an entire chain reaction throughout the whole body globally. So if I go down to the foot, I'm gonna feel the weight shifting from the inside to the outside edge of the foot. I'm then gonna feel the weight shifting from the inside to the outside of the ankle. I'm gonna feel the weight shifting at the knee joint. And of course, I'm gonna feel some things happening at the hip joint. As I arm swing around and around, I'm getting this towering in effect through the core of the body, and this helps to hydrate even at the spine and bone level. If I pay close attention to my arm swing and this towering in effect, this twisting action that I'm getting in the core of the body, I can see that my shoulders are in rotation. And with my head in a fixed position and my body rotating under it, I'm gonna then get a translation at the cervical spine. So we have many different foot positions and our foot hits the ground millions of times in our life as we walk. So if we change our foot position, we know that we're gonna get an experience, an entire different reaction throughout the whole entire body. So let's go ahead and tow it in. And as we tow it in, we're gonna to start to experience a different chain reaction. So I go down once again to the foot and the ankle and because the foot is internally rotated, I can see that the tibia, the knee, and the femur are all internally rotated, but they sit internally rotated into the intersection of the hip and the pelvis. So I'm gonna to start to arm swing around, and again, I go down to the foot. I'm gonna start experiencing different things on the inside and outside edge of the foot. I'm gonna to start to feel different things at the ankle joint. I'm definitely going to feel some different forces crossing at the knee joint and at the hip joint. I might even feel some really different things occurring in my lower back. The big question is, well, did the foot position change my arm swing ability? Did it give me motion or did it take something away? And oftentimes we can tell a lot about the body by what's not moving. So if I have great motion in one foot position and not so great in another foot position, I can quickly assess what I need to work on. So let's now experience the toe out position. We've done our toe forward, we've done our toe in. Let's see what happens when we go toed out. Okay, so in my toed out position, let's just say I'm not naturally a toed out person. Let's just say I walk naturally toed forward, or maybe I'm that person that walks slightly toed in. This externally rotated position might really feel intense for some of us that are not flexible at the hip joint. Some of you may say, well, I kind of stand externally rotated. This is kind of natural for me. And so each person is biomechanically a little different. You're going to have to experience this all for yourself, but I guarantee that one of the foot positions you're going to like more than the other two. So now that the foot is externally rotated, we can easily see that we're externally rotated at the tibia, the knee, and the femur. And again, those bones sit externally rotated into that intersection of where the hip and the pelvis come together, right at that joint. So if I arm swing around, I'm gonna feel way different things happening on the inside and outside edge of the foot. I'm certainly gonna feel some way different things happening at the ankle joint. I'm gonna feel some different things crossing the knee and of course at the hip joints. And if I'm really tight in my hips, this might be one of those um, motions that actually gives me mobility when I go back to that toe forward position. Now the arm swing, once again, gives us a lot of clues 
Do I have the same ability to rotate around and around? Was something jammed up or roadblocked that made me feel like I couldn't rotate in one direction as easily as the other? And so this gives you a lot of tools to work with to self-assess your body in motion. All right, let's talk about sagittal plane. In the sagittal plane, I've got one foot forward and I've got one foot back. Now, you'll notice that I'm starting with my feet pointing straight ahead. If I take my back foot and I externally rotate it even a little bit, you can see where it takes my whole entire hip right around the corner. You can even see my whole shoulder come around the corner. So I really wanna take a sneak peek down and make sure that that toe is in fact pointing straight ahead. Once I've got my feet in the sagittal plane, I've got one foot in front of the other, I now have to kind of look at what's going on with the body. I've got more weight down into the left side. My right leg is forward. Therefore, the facet joints on the right side of the spine are unloaded more than the other. We know this because in walking, I would have to actually load or explode off of that leg in order to take a step. So the back leg is always gonna bear a little more weight than the front leg. From a side view, if I've got one foot forward, you can easily see that I've kind of unloaded the lower back on my right side and my weight is really sitting back into my left side. So from here, I've got my pelvis in this kind of funky diagonal position because I'm in the sagittal plane and I'm gonna go ahead and arm swing around and around. Now some things are happening that are really different because maybe, because I've got more weight down into this left side, I'm gonna to start to assess my left Achilles tendon. I'm gonna to start to assess my left foot, my left ankle, my left knee, and my left hip. So I'm gonna to start to go, okay, what's different? What's different between the right side and the left side? How does that affect my right lower back versus my left lower back? Do I get the same arm swing ability? And how is that affecting my whole body global motion? Okay, so far you're with me. So let's go ahead and internally rotate both feet. I'm gonna still keep my right foot ahead of my left. I'm internally rotated. I've internally rotated the right foot. It's in a fixed position. My pelvis is coming around the corner and it's coming around the corner faster than the femur. So my femur is kind of in this fixed position while my pelvis is rotating. As that's happening, I'm getting a tremendous amount of internal rotation. I'm getting a tremendous amount of internal rotation at the hip joint. But if I cruise down to my left foot and ankle, once again, I can kind of see that that foot is internally rotated, it's fixed, I've kind of wound up my Achilles tendon, my heel, I've kind of wound up the foot and ankle, so I'm getting a tremendous amount because that hip is internally rotated, and again, going this direction, you can kind of see the pelvis is going faster with that foot internally rotated. I can kind of sense and feel that I'm getting a lot of translation at the hip joint. So once again, when I go back to my toe forward position, I'm gonna feel like I have a lot of motion available. All right, so next we're gonna go external rotation. Now, still keeping the right foot ahead of the left, I'm gonna externally rotate both feet. But notice that my pelvis is still in this funky diagonal position. Okay, right foot's ahead of the left, facet joints on the right side are unloaded more than the left, I'm gonna arm swing around, and now I'm gonna go back down to the foot. What feels different on the inside and outside edge of the foot? What feels different at the ankle joint? What feels different at the knee joint, the hip joint, and what feels different across the lower back? The observation essential is gonna be, well, so what? What feels different between the right side and the left side? If I can imagine a six-sided box that has a top and a bottom, a right and a left, and a front and a back. So we're gonna go ahead and switch feet now, and we're gonna do it all again from the beginning so that we can have a comparable or an observation essential to compare the two sides. Again, I'm gonna take a sneak peek down at now my right foot. I'm gonna know that my right foot is behind me. That's the side that's gonna be bearing a little more load and a little more weight. My left side, is the side that's forward now. So I've unloaded the facet joints on this left side of my lower back more than the right. 
I'm going to go ahead and arm swing around, but I'm going down to the foot and ankle first because I want to know what am I feeling down at the foot on the inside and outside edge? What am I feeling at the knee joint? Of course, let's not forget about the ankle joint. That's a big player too. And the hip joint. Does it change how you get your arm swing ability in your lower back? Sometimes, you know, we have issues going on in our lower back and we don't realize that there's a difference between the right side of the lower back and the left side. Notice your thoracic spine rotation. Do you have a lot of motion going one way and not the other? Or does it feel pretty even? Let's go ahead now and take and internally rotate both feet. As soon as I internally rotate both feet, we talked a little bit earlier about the feet being in a fixed position and the pelvis is moving faster than our big femur bones. These are those big bones up here uh, between the knee and the hip joint. And we know that we're getting a tremendous amount of internal rotation at the hip. And when we go back to the foot forward position, it's gonna feel nice and loosey goose. So if I take out the slack and I start arm swinging around, I'm gonna start getting that motion lotion. Every time a muscle contracts or extends, it's either pushing or pulling fluid into itself. And so motion is lotion. You hydrate the body through movement. All right, so last, you already guessed it, we're gonna externally rotate the feet. It's not rocket science. I'm gonna externally rotate both feet. I've got my left foot still ahead of the right. I know I've got more weight bearing down into this right side, so I'm gonna quickly go down to the foot and I'm gonna go, okay, what feels different at the foot and ankle? What feels different at the knee joint? What feels different at the hip joint? And of course, what's feeling different across the lower back? Interestingly enough, if I've got big differences between the right and left side, I can quickly assess which side I need to work on, which side's not moving so well versus the side that's working very well. Great job. Okay, so now that we've kind of warmed up the body and we've loosened everything up, let's go ahead and stretch out the lower back and sacrum area. Okay, let's start with our feet about hip width apart. And as we're going about hip, well, it's a little wider than hip width apart, but let's start here. Hands at the quads. You wanna stay supported as you slide forward, down and forward. Okay, now from a side view, I have a flat back position. Okay, I'm gonna start this way with my hands here for support and I'm lifting my tailbone up like kind of like a little ducktail. From here, I'm gonna go ahead and keep my hands on my quads, but I'm gonna press my shoulder down and in and I'm gonna stretch across the lower back. This is gonna to help to stretch across those ligaments of the lower back and I'm actually putting some pressure on my leg to get there. Okay, then you're gonna go ahead and stand up and come out of it. We're gonna do the other side, slide down, a little bit of pressure, drive the shoulder down and in. I'm actually using pressure with my arm to push against my leg, stand up and come out of it. When muscles contract and extend, you feel tension when you stretch a muscle, and that is pulling the fluid out. When you stand up and come back to homeostasis or come back to your neutral stance, it allows the muscles to then relax and come back to home base, and they act like a sponge and pull fluid back into themselves. Okay, so let's go back into it again. You're gonna slide down, drive the shoulder down and in, get the big stretch. Don't stay there too long. Stand on up, come out of it, allow the body to hydrate. Go ahead, slide down, drive the shoulder down and in. Go ahead and stand up, allow the body to hydrate. Beautiful. Let's go one foot forward and one foot back. Earlier we said, well, if we've got one foot forward, one foot back, we've got our pelvis in a diagonal position. True. Let's slide forward. As we slide forward, we're gonna to start to feel a little tug in the right hamstring because that's the leg that's forward. And I'm gonna do two things with the pelvis. I'm gonna lift the tailbone up towards the ceiling like a ducktail and get a big stretch in the hamstring. And then next, I'm gonna tuck the tail under to stretch across the sacrum and the lower back and get that big stretch. But notice my hands stay on my legs 
as I lift the tailbone up to get the stretch, and then go ahead and tuck the tailbone under to get the sacrum and lower back. Let's do that one more time. Go ahead and lift the tailbone up towards the ceiling. Wait for the tensioning back here. Then go ahead and tuck the tail under, feeling those stretches coming across the sacrum and low back. Hands on your quads as you go ahead and stand on up to come out of it. All right, let's go ahead and switch feet and go to the other side. Now it's important if we do one side that we're doing the other. And of course, you're gonna compare the two sides. So now left foot forward, I'm gonna go ahead and slide down. Hands stay on my quads. I'm gonna tuck the tailbone under just like we did before, feeling the stretch in the sacrum. Then go ahead and lift my tailbone up towards the ceiling, feeling the stretch now on my left hamstring. Let's do it again. I'll turn to the side so you can get a better view. I'm gonna tuck under to get that sacrum and lower back. Then I'm gonna go ahead and lift the tailbone up towards the ceiling to get the stretch through the left hamstring. Let's do that one more time. Tuck the tail way under, feeling that stretch back here at the sacrum, tailbone, low back. Go ahead and lift the tailbone towards the ceiling one more time. Go ahead and stand all the way up and relieve the pressure. Great job. Let's go a little further into that hamstring. If I position my right foot forward and my left foot back, I'm gonna go a little wide with my stance so that I have a good sense of balance. And I'm now gonna use my arms as drivers. I'm gonna take my hands and I'm gonna swing face down through the middle. Then I'm gonna come up. I'm gonna swing face to the outside. Come up and I'm gonna swing face to the other side. Let's do it again. Take an inhale and exhale here. Inhale and exhale here. <sighs> inhale and exhale here. <sighs> again, right through the middle. <sighs> Take it to the outside. <sighs> Take it to the other side. <sighs> okay, now, if I take the foot and I just tweak it out a little bit, notice I'm not tweaking it out a lot of it. I'm just gonna take it from neutral and I'm gonna tweak it a little bit because I know that a little bit of external rotation affects my hamstring in a huge way. I'm using my mass and my momentum to kind of cheat and go for that stretch in my hamstring. So let's do it together. Inhale and exhale here. <sighs> Inhale and exhale to the side. <sighs> Inhale and exhale to the other side. <sighs> Again, right through the middle. <sighs> Take it to the outside. <sighs> Take it to the other side. Let's do it one more time, right through the middle. Take it to the outside. Take it to the other side. All right, we've done our toe forward and our toe out. Let's go back to neutral, and this time, take it slightly toed in. Remember, small tweaks are huge in terms of what you're feeling at the hamstring. So sometimes less is more when you're talking about a foot position. So here we go, arms up and inhale and exhale, swing. Take it to the outside. Take it to the other side. Inhale and exhale here. Take it to the outside. Take it to the other side. One more time through, right through the middle. Take it to the outside. Take it to the other side. All right, next, we gotta do the other side. But first, let's go back to neutral. And before we switch sides, we're gonna add one more piece to the equation. And that is a locomotor pattern. I'm gonna add movement or a step with the hamstring release. So I'm still working on my right hamstring. I'm gonna bring my left foot to meet up with my right foot and I'm gonna go ahead and take a step back in swing phase and then I'm gonna stand up. I'll demonstrate that one more time. Swing phase and stand back up. You'll notice that the step is very tiny. When I'm stepping backwards, it's a small step so that I can successfully get there and stand up and come out of it. Here's the thing. If my step is too big, my foot will externally rotate. As soon as I externally rotate, it takes me right out of that sagittal plane and I start to lose the effectiveness of what I'm trying to achieve in the hamstring mobility stretch. So small is more but use the swing face of the arms and the speed and the mass and the momentum to help you cheat and get more functionality out of the hamstring. We're gonna do eight of these. Here we go, deep breath, inhale and exhale. One, 
Inhale and exhale two. Inhale and exhale three. Inhale and exhale four. Inhale and exhale five. Inhale and exhale six. Inhale and exhale seven. Inhale and exhale eight. The test is the exercise and the exercise becomes the test. So how do we measure whether or not we got more flexibility in our hamstring? Well, it's very easy. I'm gonna quickly step back with my left foot and I'm gonna lean forward to feel the flexibility in my right hamstring. I have not done my left side, but I'm gonna compare it by immediately stepping back with the opposite foot and ooh, I feel a huge roadblock. I just feel that tug and that tensioning coming so much faster in the side I have not done. So I know if I don't do the other side, it's gonna be weird because I'm gonna have one side super flexible and one side that feels all bound up and tight. Okay, so quick test again is you test the side you've done immediately against the side you have not done. There should be a difference between the two. You're never gonna see the truth of the motion from the first couple of arm swings, you're not gonna see the truth in the motion until you've gone through the whole sequence. Let's start. I'm gonna position now my left foot forward, my right foot back. I'm gonna go through the same arms, inhale and exhale right through the middle, <sighs> inhale and exhale to the side, <sighs> inhale and exhale to the other side. <sighs> Again, right through the middle, <sighs> take it to the side, <sighs> take it to the other side. One more time, right through the middle. Take it to the side. Take it to the other side. Now, we said earlier that if we turn the foot slightly out, we tweak it out, that we would get a different response in that hamstring, and this is very true. So remember, small is more. Inhale and exhale. Inhale and exhale, let's go to the side. Inhale and exhale, let's go to the other side right through the middle, take it to the side, take it to the other side. Again, right through the middle, take it to the side, and take it to the other side. All right, gang, now we go back to our neutral position, but as you know, we're gonna take it from neutral to a tweaked in position. It doesn't take much, but we gotta tweak it in just a little. Inhale and exhale right through the middle, Inhale and exhale to the side. Inhale and exhale to the other side. Again, right through the middle. Take it to the side. Take it to the other side. Again, one more time through the middle. Take it to the side. And take it to the other side. All right, so last, we're gonna move the foot back to the neutral position. We're gonna add our locomotor pattern, which is our little tiny step, remembering that the step is small while we go through the swing phase. The bigger the step, the more it's gonna throw you off your balance because if you take up the slack and you've used it all up and the body says, hey, I got nothing left to give, you're gonna lose your balance and you're gonna feel like you're falling all over the place. So remember, small steps, big arm swing, add some speed. So here we go, big eight and seven more, and six, and five, and four, and three, two, and one more. All right, the test is the exercise. The exercise becomes the test. How do we test it? We're gonna step back with the right foot, we're gonna stand up and immediately step back with the left foot. Now, as you're stepping back and alternating, you're gonna decide if you've got one side that's still tighter than the other. Sometimes you might still have one side that feels tighter than the other. If that's the case, it's okay to go and repeat the side that's giving you the tension or the trouble or feeling jammed up or gunked up or sticky, gluey, like it's not sliding and gliding evenly. Okay, let's move on. After we've gone through the hamstring mobility stretches, I like to then kind of cruise on up to the thoracic spine. The thoracic spine basically is from the shoulders to the rib cage. It allows us to flex and extend, 
It allows us to laterally flex in the frontal plane, and it allows us to rotate in the transverse plane. So the thoracic spine is basically the rib cage, a giant cage that comes off the spine, wraps around the front of the body, and holds together all your vital organs. So if our upper back or thoracic spine gets jammed up somewhere between here and here, if we have a lot of congestion there, it's probably going to not absorb shock like it should. And so in walking, when the thoracic spine collapses and extends or flexes and extends like it does naturally in walking and even in breathing, if it's not moving like it should, what's above it, which is the neck, is probably going to take the jam and what's below it, the lower back, is probably going to take the hit. So an upper thoracic spine that moves well is super important to us, isn't it? Let's go ahead and step with our right foot forward and our left foot back. I'm then going to go ahead and extend my right arm all the way up. And you can kind of remember from earlier in the video that when we step forward with one leg that we've unloaded the facet joints on that side of the lower back. In this case, my right foot is forward, so I've unloaded the facet joints on the right side of the lower back. I'm going to go ahead and traction up by reaching up as high as possible to create a lot of space between the bones. And from here, I'm in the sagittal plane, but I'm going to take my left arm and I'm going to go right rotational in the transverse plane. Now, as I'm rotating in the transverse plane, I'm going to add one more piece to this, and it's kind of a wave goodbye behind the head, but I'm going to get some lateral flexion along with some rotation. So now I have multiplanar motions going. I'm in the sagittal plane with my foot position, arm is up in the sagittal plane, rotation, transverse plane, lateral flexion, frontal plane. So I've got multiplanar actions, and I'm going after that upper thoracic spine, and this is going to give you a nice release in your upper back. Okay, now I'm going to do a couple things that I'm going to look for. One is, how close can I get my arm to my ear? Is there some gunk or jammed up tissues there that isn't allowing me to wave behind my head? It's a whole different thing when my hand ends up coming in front of my face versus behind my head. These are two totally different translations. And if I have a shoulder issue or a shoulder injury, this might be a big aha moment as to what is holding up or jamming up that upper thoracic spine. Okay, now let's leave our feet exactly where they are, but we're going to change our arms. And so now I'm going to go all the way up with my left arm, and I'm going to take my right arm, and I'm going to go left rotation. And of course, now I'm going to take my left hand, I'm going to wave goodbye, and I'm going to laterally flex to the side. So I'm getting that lateral flexion, transverse plane rotation. It's like, wow, why is it that it feels so completely different when I change the arms? I've kept my feet exactly the same position, but now I've changed the direction of the arm swing, and it feels totally different. Now, guaranteed, you're going to like one of these more than the other. Maybe you have more shoulder function on one side than the other. It depends. It depends on each individual. But you're basically going to compare the two sides. Now, let's go ahead and switch feet. Let's go back to the exact same arm position. Left arm goes all the way up. I'm still, or left arm goes all the way up. I'm still going to take my right arm and go left rotational. And here's the deal. I'm going to get that lateral flexion. Now, because I've switched my foot position, the same arm swing might feel totally different. Okay, so you gotta, you gotta decide. But guaranteed, <laughs> one of these you're gonna like more than the other. Okay, we gotta do the other side. So again, assessing, going right rotation. We haven't done this one yet with the left foot forward. We did it with the right foot forward, but now notice what feels different. It's gonna be way different than when we had the other foot forward. Super good job. Nicely done. All right, so now let's talk about the pelvis. The pelvis is your center of gravity. 
pretty much all of the motion that comes up from the ground up comes through the pelvis. Uh, shock is absorbed oftentimes at the pelvis. And from a top-down perspective, everything from the top down goes through the pelvis. So the pelvis is really the center part of our body or what we would call the big shock absorber. I'm going to go ahead and step out in the frontal plane and I'm going to go to a lateral lunge position. In my lateral lunge position, I've got my weight into my right leg. And you'll notice that my left leg is in an extended position. And this is going to really open up my left hip joint. Okay, I should feel some tension on that adductor or inner thigh. I'm weighted more into my right leg, but I've got this leg extended out, so I feel a lot of tension coming through that left hip. From here, I'm going to take my pelvis and I'm going to move it in the sagittal plane. I'm going to move it forward and I'm going to move it back. I'm going to get extension through the hip. I'm going to get a little bit of flexion into the hip. Remember earlier we talked about that rubber band. When the rubber band gets pulled tight, the fluid gets pushed out. When the rubber band goes back, it allows it to suck fluid into itself. So we want to go through flexion and extension on the anterior side of that left hip. I'm not leaning back so far that I get a big bite of pain across the low back. In fact, if you get a big bite of pain towards the lower back, I say really modify this and do your motions much smaller. Okay, so now we're gonna add to this. I'm going forward and back with the pelvis, but now I'm gonna add the arm drive. I'm gonna reach up, and remember that when we reach up, this is gonna give us slack, this is gonna take slack out, more slack, more slack. The higher I reach, the more traction I get, the more space between the bones. So I'm going to flex and extend right here. And of course, I'm going through the sagittal plane. I'm in a frontal plane leg stance, and I've got my adductor under tension, but I'm really going after that anterior left hip in the sagittal plane. So from here, I'm going to keep my uh, stance exactly where it is, but now I'm going to go through the frontal plane. So I want you to get a little sassy with the hips, get a little motion lotion happening, and I'm going to start leaning into it. I'm going to take that pelvis and drive it. I'm going to take that pelvis and drive it. I'm going to take that pelvis and drive it. We're going through the frontal plane of motion. So I'm going right and left here. I'm going to take my arms now and I'm going to go opposite of the pelvic drive. You'll notice that the shoulders and the pelvis work together. As my shoulders drop to the left, my pelvis is driving to the right, so I'm getting this kind of a motion and I'm going to start to really open up that anterior hip in the frontal plane now. Let's do a couple more. All right, so now we have one more plane of motion to go after, and that is our transverse plane rotation. Transverse plane is all about rotation. Okay, so if I'm rotating, that means I'm moving one direction and I, or I'm moving the other. Now, when I take the pelvis and I rotate one direction, I might feel a tremendous amount of tensioning. When I go the other direction, I might feel something totally different Remember, your weight is still into this right side because we're kind of in that lateral lunge position. You're going to reach high with the arms. You're going to rotate, and then you're going to rotate. You're going to rotate. You're going to rotate. Guarantee that one of these rotations, you're going to say, wow, that feels super tight. Like, I feel all my abdominals just on fire with this rotation and that would be true because all your abdominals are connected down into the pelvic floor and we are in fact going after the left hip which is part of that pelvic floor okay so now i'm going to go ahead and kind of weave my way out of it i'm going to come back to neutral what am i going to do to test my hip well i can walk 
and I can automatically go, whoa, that feels pretty loose. And this side, not so much, but this side's like wonk, right? I got, it. it's almost like so loose that I feel like, wow, it's like a, it's like a overstretched rubber band. But here's the other thing I could do. I could lift my leg and notice how light it feels compared to the side I have not done, which feels stiff and heavy, right? Nice and light, eh, stiff and heavy. If I do a hip circle, ooh, that feels smooth, uh, not so smooth. Maybe I don't have as good a motion on the side I have not done. So you can quickly start to assess and see how fast the active stretch works. If you wanna know if it's working, test it. It should be working right now. Okay, I'm gonna lunge to my left side now, put all of my weight into that left leg while I'm going after my now extended right hip. I know that I'm gonna feel some tensioning coming right across the joint capsule, but I'm also gonna feel some tension down into the adductor. And as soon as I lean into this, it's like, wow, okay, I can feel a big difference already between the two sides. I'm gonna go ahead in the sagittal plane and go forward and back. And as I go forward and back, I am experiencing a lengthening, a stretch in that anterior hip capsule on the right side. If I go ahead and reach up with my arms, we said, well, if we reach up here, this is great, but if we reach up higher, it's gonna give us more traction, more traction, more traction. So as soon as I get my arms up as high as possible, I can feel my abdominals kicking in, and I'm gonna go forward back. Be careful about your lower back. Again, if you start to experience a bite of pain in your lower back, you wanna kinda just maybe don't go back as far. Or maybe you could go back with one arm or maybe even alternate your arms and not even do both arms at the same time. So these are options for you and you can definitely explore on your own. Okay, so now I'm gonna get sassy with those hips, right? We said we're gonna get sassy with those hips and we're gonna drive in that frontal plane, drive in that frontal plane, drive in that frontal plane. All right, I'm gonna take my arms and I'm gonna go opposite of the hip because I know that where my shoulders are going, my pelvis is driving opposite, and so I'm gonna get that true frontal plane motion happening at the hip joint and at the pelvis. Inhale and exhale as you do these. Deep breath, inhale and exhale. All right, you should be feeling some action into those hip joints. Super good. Let's just do a couple more. Beautiful. All right, now we're gonna go through the famous transverse plane. I'm still gonna have my weight to my left side. I'm gonna rotate. I'm gonna make sure that my pelvis is rotating in both directions, right? I might feel more tension when I rotate one direction and less tension when I rotate another direction. This is for you to explore. Hands go way up, we're gonna rotate. Remember that you're lunging into your left side and rotate. Rotate and rotate. Again, rotate and rotate. Don't judge anything by the first couple motions because motion is lotion. Movement begets more movement and so the more you do, the looser you get. Last one, go ahead, weave it together. All right, the exercise is the test, the test is the exercise. You already know, you took a step with this side, it felt loosey goose, how about when we go to this side? How about when we go to this side? How about when we go to this side? All right, you get the idea. When I lift my leg, does it feel loose? or light, when I compare it to the other side, do they feel closer to the same? How about when I do those hip circles? Is that feeling closer to the same now? And usually they're feeling pretty close. Once again, if you had a big gap,
between the two sides, you want to go back and start thin slicing it in and see if you can get them a little closer to symmetrical. All right, let's talk about now the ankle joint. If I start with my toes pointing straight ahead and I want to test and see how much dorsiflexion I have in my ankle. And by dorsiflexion, I mean this kind of motion. This would be plantar flexion, this is dorsiflexion, but what I want to test in this particular translation is how much dorsiflexion am I getting. So I'm going to start with a simple ankle squat. I'm going to squat into my feet and squat into my ankles. From a side view, you're going to watch the tibia move over the top of the foot and then you're going to stand back up. Now, here's the deal. Here's the big huckleberry nugget that you're looking for. When the heel pops up, that tells you you've used up all the slack. There isn't any more to give. The ankle has gone through all the dorsiflexion it's going to get and the heel pops up. That's what you're feeling for. Just prior to heel lift is your true range of motion that you actually have available just prior to heel lift. Okay, so let's see what happens when you squat down. When you're squatting down, you should feel some tension coming up through the back of the legs and the calves, right? Most of us are gonna go, whoa, that's really, really feeling super tight. If you're not getting it, step a little wider and let's try now to touch the knees together. We would see this a lot of times in snow skiing. With snow skiers, you'll see them do the flying wedge where they're doing this kind of thing. And I guarantee you, if you step a little bit wider, you drive the knees down and in, one of the heels is gonna to wanna to pop up sooner than the other. If you're still not getting the translation, step out a little wider, try to touch them together, continue to test it out until you can't go any further. And once you've gotten to that point where you get heel lift on one side, you can then assess my right side is tighter than my left or my left side is tighter than my right. But now you have a huckleberry because you've got something to work on when you've got something that's not quite symmetrical. So if you've got asymmetries in the body, it gives you something to work on and you can continue to work on your ankle squat ability. Well, why is ankle squat ability so important? In walking, when I take a step, I want to be able to drop my foot down and in and absorb the shock. But as soon as my body starts coming over, you can see where that tibia now is starting to move over the foot. If I don't have good dorsiflexion in the ankle, I'm never going to get through good hip extension. And if I've got a premature strike, with the heel and a premature strike with the foot, I may never get through good hip extension. And guess who's going to take the jam? The knee. The knee is a dumb joint caught in the middle with few places to go. It's either literally driven by the forces of the foot smashing into the ground, or it's driven by the hip from the top down feeding into the knee. The knee is kind of it's like on a train track and it's either going to absorb shock well for you or it's going to be maybe a poor shock absorber and then you're going to experience knee pain later on. So checking for your ankle flexibility, again, toes forward. You're going to go ahead and squat down into your feet and ankles. You could go a little wider, knee in from a side view. It looks like this. Let's do it from a back view where it looks like this. Okay, so those are going to be your three. You can always take it out a little bit wider, right? Test it out. Once you've gone through some ankle motion and mobility, go ahead and put it to the test. See if it's improved your walking. See if it's improved the trunk extension that you get, and of course, all the flexion and the extension that you're gonna get through the trunk of the body. So I hope this was helpful. My name is Pam Marchone, and this is Active Stretch Restorative Movement. This is only one piece of Active Stretch Restorative Movement. I cover many different body parts 
and many different motions and movements throughout the Active Stretch Restorative Movement series. So stay tuned because every time I shoot a video, there's going to be a new nugget of information in there for you. Okay, that's it for now. Bye-bye.